Hi, this is Shana Miko, and I'm going to give you a quick rundown on some respiratory disorders in the pediatric world. Um, this will be just kind of a brief overview. We won't get too in-depth, um, but feel free to contact me with any questions. This is just a study tool just to help out and supplement. This is not meant to take place of any lectures um, or independent study or looking up things, doing NCLEX questions. This is also not to be disseminated to anybody or played publicly. This is just for a friend to help out for studying for peds. The slides I uh, usually get from Wong's pediatric books. Everybody knows Wong's if you're in peds. Um, a lot of the material also comes from a book called Straight A's in Pediatric Nursing by Lippincott, which is a fantastic book. Um, I recommend doing NCLEX questions from Child Health Nursing Reviews and Rationales by Prentice Hall. That's a phenomenal book. Um, you can download some audio lectures off of vangonotes.com. And some of the cute little cartoon pictures I use come from the Memory Notebook of Nursing um, by the Nursing Education Consultants. So I am not paid to do this. This is completely voluntary, um, and I have no disclosures. So good luck. So for the most part of the lecture, we'll be talking about respiratory infections in children. Um, you should already be pretty familiar with the respiratory system uh, from AMP and MedSurge. It's pretty much the same, just some a few uh, structural differences. First, you have your upper respiratory tract, which is your oropharynx, your nasopharynx, your pharynx, also called the throat, and your larynx, which is the upper part of your trachea. And then your lower respiratory tract, which is your trachea, which is made up of C-shaped cartilage rings, um, smooth muscles. And then your bronchi, which um, branch off into two lungs. Uh, your bronchi, uh, it's important to know that the right bronchus is shorter, a bit wider, and more vertical. So when kids aspirate things or uh, have a foreign body object, they're more likely to go into that right bronchus because it's just easier to pass through. Any of you who have worked in an ICU or have intubated a patient also know of the risks of accidentally putting that breathing tube into that right main stem bronchus just because it's so accessible. Um, and then we also have those uh, bronchioles and alveoli. So the bronchi split off into two lungs, and inside those lungs you get into smaller branches of bronchioles, and then at the end of the bronchioles are your alveoli, which is where the main, um, main gas exchange occurs, really. Uh, this is at risk to being underdeveloped and having issues in young infants, neonates, NICU babies, preterm babies, because they just don't have the surfactant, and we'll talk about that a little bit in BPD. Um, it's essentially like an upside down tree, but I'm sure you guys are all pretty familiar with that. When it comes to age and respiratory infections, age does matter. Infants under the age of three months still have mom's um, antibodies, especially if they're breastfeeding more so but uh, just from being born, they still carry mom's antibodies. So they have a lower rate of infection um, when it comes to respiratory issues. That's uh, not including sepsis or anything. Um, rate increases between three and six months because mom's antibodies are uh, wearing off and they're trying to discover their own. Um, and then anywhere between toddler and preschool, we have a really high rate of viral infections, and that's for obvious reasons. These kids are getting socialized. They're going to the Petri dishes that are daycares and schools and uh, just kind of sharing everybody's germs. Um, when kids get older, they um, have a more common risk of mycoplasma and beta hemolytic streptococcal infections. I'd say the most common infection for those three to six month olds is going to be that RSV, the respiratory succinctal virus, and bronchiolitis um, caused by the RSV. It's pretty common. Um, and then as kids get older and are exposed to more things and, and have more run ins with illnesses, they're more likely to develop their own immune system. Okay, so another major anatomical difference in children that makes them different from adults, also makes them a bit more susceptible to respiratory infections, um, is the diameter of their airway um, or the back of their throat, their esophagus and their bronchus, makes the kids more susceptible to edema, swelling, mucus production, more likely to have an airway obstruction because of that. 
Um, if you notice uh, in this photo the eustachian tube, the one on the left is of a child. Um, that eustachian tube, which is the portion of their middle ear, um, or access to the middle ear, it's short, it's wide, and it's straight, which makes it really easy for bacteria and pathogens to access the inner ear. Um, as you know from anatomy and physiology, once you're in that area, it's uh, pretty much connected to the sinuses, the pharynx, uh, and then it, from there it's a hop, skip, and a jump to your lungs. So you'll often see children, if they have an earache um, or, you know, a, a science stuffy nose or something like that, they are also going to have some respiratory symptoms. The drainage, you know, that kids are swallowing, it kind of all just communicates there. So it's easy for a pathogen to, to spread pretty quickly. Also, um, it's good to note that about the epiglottis, which is that flap in the back of the throat that covers up our, uh, our uh, bronchi or trachea whenever we're trying to swallow food or drink. Um, it prevents adults from aspirating and um, moving food and beverages into the airways. In children, it's underdeveloped. It's um, a little bit longer and located kind of in a different place. Um, so it's not as effective. Kids are more likely to aspirate on their food and liquids, which can, you know, of course, lead into aspiration pneumonia. And also the cartilage that is in the bronchial airways is very soft and susceptible to bronchospasms. From an assessment standpoint, just looking at a kid, you'll see that their chest is more rounded um, than an adult, or rather a respiratory healthy adult. Um, any of you who have seen older adults with uh, advanced COPD you can note that barrel chest. Um, but in a healthy adult, we are more wide than we are thick as far as chest diameter goes. In a children, this is actually not true. A child is more round or circular um, just because of their underdeveloped respiratory muscles, which is also why they're belly breathers or diaphragmatic breathers. If you look at a child up until the age of six sometimes, they will, uh, they'll have rise and fall in their stomach um, whenever they breathe rather in their upper, upper chest area or their rib area. And that's just because of underdevelopment of the diaphragm and intercostal muscles and as those develop as the child gets older. Also important to note that kids are obligatory nose breathers, especially infants, which means they're not really going to breathe through their mouth, they're going to breathe through their nose. And that's a much smaller airway, much smaller diameter to move air. And if that gets clogged, that can definitely um, cause some symptoms for them. Also, infants um, are born with a lot less alveoli. Uh, we have nine times more alveoli as an adolescent and an adult than we do at birth and fewer alveoli, since that's the area of gas exchange. Fewer alveoli means there's less surface area to have that gas exchange. Um, also, preemie infants, and we won't get into it, NICU infants, preterms, uh, they will also have issues with their alveoli because of the lack of surfactant production, which usually is developed in utero somewhere after 25, 26 weeks. So kids around this time really have a hard time, of, uh, hard time with it. Another point, jumping back to that last slide about surfactant production, it starts at about 25 weeks, um, but it's the babies aren't ready uh, to be independently breathing at that time because surfactant doesn't really start working effectively until somewhere after 32, 33 weeks, which is why we often have to give surfactant to preterm babies. Okay, now I can move on to this slide. Sorry about that. If anyone has already had the pleasure of working with children, you know that sometimes whenever they're sick or at a certain age, it's challenging to get a, a proper assessment on them, to really get the stethoscope on them and listen to them. Um, so take advantage of um, a visual assessment, their appearance, their positioning. Oftentimes we can really see a lot about their respiratory status just from looking at them. Are they breathing through their mouth, which means that their nasal passage is occluded? Are they drooling, which means that somewhere in their upper airway they're occluded and they're not able to swallow? Are they leaned forward and in that tripod position where they're trying to make their chest area as big as possible to take in as much air? Are they pursing their lips when they're exhaling, which is a sign of them really trying to force out some trapped air. 
Do they have accessory muscle use or nasal flaring? If you can lift up the shirt, do they have intercostal retractions or even worse, suprasternal retractions like right uh, at the base of your neck above your above your sternum, if you have retractions there, that's, that's an, an unfortunate sign. How fast are they breathing? Now remember children do breathe much faster than adults. Infants can breathe over 60 times a minute. But are they breathing fast? Are they breathing slow? Do you have a child that looks lethargic, um, a school-aged child, and they're breathing eight times a minute? That is unfortunate as well, and I suggest bagging them immediately. And also their circulation. Uh, are, do they look pale? Do they look like they are struggling? Um, do they look cyanotic? Look at their mucous membranes and their lips. Um, a lot of things that you can get before you even put a pulse ox on them, which is sometimes a challenge with children. So here's one of those uh, cartoon slides, mnemonics that I like to use. Um, helps me study, or it did whenever I was in school. Some symptoms of hypoxia or a low oxygenation status, low uh, oxygenation in the tissues, is going to be um, early signs or RAT. That's restlessness, anxiety, a tachycardia, and tachypnea. You can obviously tell that this child is struggling to breathe because they're restless. If you've ever held your breath or been underwater and you're ready to take that breath again, you kind of get that panic or anxiety. So these kids will be a little restless. Late signs would be bed. Bradycardia, which would be a very late sign, extreme restlessness, or even lethargy, really, um, and dyspnea, some severe um, breathing difficulties, sounds, or uh, just labored pattern of breathing. And in pediatrics, some other signs, especially in babies, are going to be feeding difficulties. The kids aren't going to want to eat because if they're using their mouth to eat, then they're, again, having to use up their stuffed nose to breathe, and it's just not going to work if they're ill or having some respiratory difficulty. Inspiratory strider, um, that's some signs of some swelling or maybe even an obstruction. Uh, nasal flaring, uh, expiratory grunting, and sternal retractions, as we talked earlier. Another slide just showing some uh, signs and symptoms. Hypoxemia technically means low oxygen status in the blood. You should know by now that um, very little oxygen is actually dissolved in the blood. That's mostly carbon dioxide that gets dissolved in the blood. Oxygen is primarily carried by the hemoglobin. That is exactly what hemoglobin was born to do, to fill up with oxygen. So whenever you place a pulse ox on a child and it says that it's 98, 95, or whatever, that's estimating the percentage of hemoglobin that is, um, that is surrounded by oxygen, that is doing its job in carrying oxygen. Um, with a pulse ox, know that that just is referring to the oxygenation status of the hemoglobin um, in pulsatile blood. You need to have a pulse to have a pulse ox. Um, I know that sounds obvious, but when you're in an emergency situation and you're wondering why your pulse ox isn't reading, maybe take that as a sign that you need to do some other assessments as well um, for your child. Um, which, you know, again, sounds obvious, but when you're in an emergency, Sometimes you don't think clearly. Um, and then it doesn't really tell us the status of tissue perfusion. It really is just strictly the, the hemoglobin oxygenation status. Tissue perfusion is a whole other thing, and that's something that you really need your eyes to kind of assess with. So, um, but I think all kids need to have a pulse ox put on them, even if they don't look symptomatic. Um, it doesn't hurt to check, better safe than sorry. And a lot of pediatric um, undiagnosed congenital heart defects are found by just simply putting a pulse ox on a child. Your goal for a pediatric pulse ox is going to be greater than 92%, unless, of course, you have a congenital heart child, then, um, you know, that can be anywhere, and we won't get into that now. But just to note, I am a cardiac intensive care nurse for peds, and I heart the heart. So when we get to that section, I will nerd out. Um, so anyway, um, on this slide, you notice that some early signs of the hypoxemia I wanted to mention was the increased SBP or systolic blood pressure, and that's just going to be part of that anxiety. Everything else, I think, was on the previous slide. So I'm not going to talk about uh, blood gases like cat gas, BBG, and ABG in this lecture. I usually talk about it when I do fluid electrolyte and acid base balance, which um, I do in anatomy and physiology. So I don't think we'll get into that whenever we're doing peds. 
However, if you guys want a supplemental lecture on that, just let Shamel or Ira know, and I can try to put something together um, whenever we get more, more into this. Uh, so let's talk about the clinical manifestations of respiratory tract infections. Um, kids are quite interesting because they develop different kinds of symptoms that you may not always associate with respiratory um, symptoms that you would see in adults because children are special and they do what they want. So infants and young children, especially between six months and three years, will react more severely to respiratory infections and will have more generalized symptoms, which are kind of hard to distinguish from other illnesses. Um, so this is why we send a lot of cultures, a lot of swabs, because we got to figure out what's going on. A fever may or may not be present in newborns. Newborns uh, have a difficult time regulating their temperature, um, so they can mask that or they can have a high fever. Um, Usually fever is going to be more common in the kids six months to three years old. It can even be high up to 103 to 105 with even just a mild infection. Do not be too concerned and associate a high temperature with the um, febrile seizures. That's actually more associated with how rapidly the temperature changes, not actually how high it goes, uh, which is a common misconception. Um, kids can also get listless or lethargic, irritable, and um, kind of, you know, a little bit punky and change their routine. They, they may not be hungry, they may not want to play, things of that nature. Uh, poor feeding anorexia, especially in bottle and breastfed infants, because as we were talking before, kids are obligatory nose breathers. So whenever you're occluding their mouth and asking them to suck and swallow on a breast or a nipple, uh, for a bottle and then they have to breathe through their nose, that's just too much and they're not getting the air that they need. So they're probably going to avoid eating. Um, and vomiting and diarrhea, which I know doesn't sound like a respiratory symptom, but you know, kids are crazy, right? And it's more common in small kids. Um, vomiting is, is definitely a sign that your kid is sick, uh, sick no matter what. So, but usually something respiratory wise, and this can be drainage going into the stomach, a sinus infection, um, and anything of that nature. So, and uh, you know, you want to be concerned about that because of obviously causing of dehydration. Uh, respiratory sounds, uh, I know you guys have heard them all, so I won't even have to go over that. So the main thing to remember when we're trying to treat kids with respiratory illness is there's uh, very little that we can do, but what we do is incredibly important. So one, rest. You don't want your child running around doing circles or um, you know getting exhausted because they're already having a hard enough time getting the air in that they want. Um, so if the child won't lay quietly in bed, allow them to play quietly, give them toys, give them whatever they want. Um, it's better than to have them screaming and crying whenever they're already respiratorily compromised. Try to keep them as comfortable as possible, and that's going to be pillows, keeping them up, kind of sitting up in bed or in a chair or being held by mom or dad or whatever their caregiver situation is, um, just to allow expansion of that uh, thoracic cavity so they can take in as much air as they want. Um, try to keep their nose clear of secretions, especially in young, so that they can eat better. Um, be careful whenever you're doing your NP suctioning, your nasopharyngeal suctioning, or your nasal suctioning. Kids hate this with a passion, so it is going to set them off. So don't do this immediately before they eat. Try to take 20, 30 minutes um, to do this before they eat. That way they're not angry and so mad and crying and hyperventilating that they're not going to want to eat or that they're more likely to aspirate while they're crying or screaming or throw up or something like that. Um, we want to also try to reduce their fever. I know fever is a natural process by the body for those of you uh, hippie earthy people. but um, And I know that it tries to fight off the pathogens that are in there. But a kid with a fever is a punky kid. So give them some Tylenol. Um, and if they're old enough or they don't have any contraindications, some ibuprofen. Um, also, it's good to know that even though we alternate Tylenol and ibuprofen, usually ibuprofen every two to six, eight hours and Tylenol every four to six hours, you can at one time, just one time a day at bedtime, give Tylenol and ibuprofen at the same time. Ibuprofen lasts longer and it'll just help the kids sleep without getting a fever breakthrough through the night. Try to keep them as hydrated as possible. Now, I know this is really challenging because we just talked about how they're not going to want to eat or drink because they're stuffy nose, but we're talking anything 
that you can even get in them. Um, it's, we'll talk about this with GI, with the vomiting and diarrhea kids. Even if you have to get a teaspoon and just do teaspoon at a time of, you know, um, Pedialyte, preferably not like a sugary substance like Gatorade, unless you have low sugar Gatorade, um, or water, but preferably something with some electrolytes. I would avoid milk as milk does increase the production of mucus. Um, and that can just get really gross whenever they vomit it up. You'll never eat ice cream or cottage cheese again. Um, so yeah, definitely try to work on the dehydration, especially if they're nausea, uh, nauseated, they're vomiting, they're having di diarrhea. And keeping them hydrated, remember, helps keep their secretions thin. Now, if you're giving them an expectorant, like uh, one of those mucus medications, remember that thins mucus by drawing water from your body. So your body is going to get dehydrated, liquefying those secretions. So make sure those kids are getting enough hydration and then nutrition, whatever they'll take in, um, you know, finger foods, anything like that to keep them healthy enough so they can fight their respiratory illness. Some other interventions or ways that we can care for these kids with respiratory issues is to keep that pulse oximeter on them or the pulse ox. So you want your SATs above 92%. Um, I said sats, not stats. Please, please spread the word, for goodness sakes. That is just such a pet peeve. But anyway, you want your sats greater than 92%, unless, of course, you have a cardiac kid. Um, on your smaller babies and infants, rather than trying to put them on their fingers and toes, you can place them on the lateral part or the skinny part of the palm of their hand or the um, their uh, tiny little foot beneath their little pinky toe rather than going on their digits. So it's really challenging. Um, Choose wisely whenever you're applying oxygen. You, uh, you might have a hard time getting a face mask on an infant or a nasal cannula on a toddler. Um, oftentimes, parents can assist with this, whether doing a therapeutic hold and even holding blow-by oxygen in front of a child. Try to make sure that all your oxygen that you do apply for children is humidified. Um, yeah, let's see, try to keep your patient from crying, which I know is super challenging in pediatrics, but remember a crying kid is at risk for, you know, having bronchospasms, increased respiratory distress, aspiration on the secretions, um, things can go from, from good to ugly with a, with a crying kid that's in respiratory distress. Um, CPT or chest physiotherapy or PD, which is postural drainage. PD you'll do more with your like your cystic fibrosis kids, your CFers, whenever you're really trying to mobilize stuck secretions. Otherwise, in a normal respiratory uh, infection, usually CPT or chest physiotherapy gets the job done by breaking up some of the the secretions and the mucus that are stuck inside those airways. You can do that one of two ways with a cupped palm of your hand. Um, and be firm. Babies actually really love it. They, it breaks up gas bubbles whenever you're doing it, so they find it quite comforting. This is also something good that's helpful for colicky babies, but anyway, uh, I digress. Um, and then also like a face mask, the ones that have those air cushioned kind of nose bridges, the, the cushion masks, you can also use those to do uh, chest physiotherapy on children. So it really helps break up their secretions. Uh, you can do aerosol treatments or MDIs, the metered dose inhalers. Um, for your aerosol treatments and MDIs, remember to rinse out their mouth afterwards. Otherwise, they can be at risk for fungal infections and just bad taste, and it can alter, alter their food and, and flavors. Um, when you're teaching the kids to do MDIs, if they have a regular puffer, don't put the mouth on the puffer, please. Just shake, shake, shake. Hold it about a couple inches away from the mouth. You puff, you squeeze, you... Um, Inhale, hold it for 10 seconds, shake, do it again, you know, a couple minutes later. In younger kids, it's wise to get a spacer, and that's kind of like this plastic tube that hooks onto the end of the puffer, and that way the medicine goes in there and that they can breathe in. Otherwise, for young kids, it's really hard for them to coordinate, you know, squeeze, puff, inhale, hold, and, and all that jazz. It's kind of complicated. So, But please make sure you are rinsing out their mouth. We touched on this a little bit earlier, but remember when you are doing suctioning, especially uh, around your chest physiotherapy, do time it um, pretty well for these kids. You don't want to do it immediately before they eat um, because you can work, work up their uh, bronchospasms and airways, 
but you do want to do it, you know, within 30 minutes, 45 minutes before they eat because you do want to clear their airways. And you don't want to do it probably within an hour or two after they eat, otherwise they'll yak on you. Now, I have no idea why the outline says to skip otitis media because that's super common in children. So I just want to say a couple brief things and then I'll move on to tonsillitis. Otitis media is inflammation in the middle ear. Um, it's mostly caused by strep pneumonia or H. influenza or staph or gram-negative bacteria. Um, kids can get it whenever they have a respiratory infection or they have allergies. Um, or they have like an impaction or earwax in their ear. Um, it clogs up the eustachian tube and causes an infection, so which uh, again affects all your sinus cavity. Um, usually this happens around uh, the time of an upper respiratory uh, tract infection. They'll get earaches. The younger kids that aren't able to communicate that will pull at their ears or rub the side of their head. They may or may not get a fever. And if you have ear drainage, that's unfortunate because that usually means that your eardrum has perforated. Um, infants are going to be crying, fussy. They're going to be rubbing their head, rolling their head from side to side and have a loss of appetite. And older kids are definitely going to be fussy, irritable, and also have a loss of appetite. Undiagnosed and untreated otitis media or chronic otitis media can cause hearing loss, um, which can, um, again, you know, have long-term effects on your kid cause tinnitus, vertigo, anything like that. Um, easily treated with antibiotics, and sometimes kids that have chronic otitis media need some ear tubes. They're called BMTs, or bilateral myringotomy tubes. Some of you who are parents may be very familiar with these little darn things that fall out all the time. Um, but that is just all I wanted to mention, and I am done. All right, let's talk tonsillitis. I'm sure we have all had this. Um, and some of you may have had a tonsillectomy. So uh, tonsillitis is acute chronic inflammation of the tonsils. It can be caused by group A beta hemolytic streptococcal infection that I call the GABS, the group A beta hemolytic streptococcal. It's one of my favorites. Um, or any other sort of bacterial infection. It can even be caused by viruses. So basically, um, your tonsils are a mass of lymphoid tissue that are around the nasal and oral pharynx that consist of three pairs of tonsils. So those big ones that are in the back of your throat that everybody just assumes are your regular tonsils are just one set of three pairs. So those are the palatine tonsils, the ones that we can see mostly. And then we have pharyngeal tonsils, which are also known as adenoids. You may be familiar with the term a TNA or a tonsillectomy and adenoidectomy. And those are on the back wall of the nasopharynx above the palatine tonsils. And then hidden way, way, way in the back are lingual tonsils, and those are at the base of the tongue, and those aren't really ever really removed. They're very challenging to get to anyway. Some complications of tonsillitis can be obviously obstruction because your tonsils get swollen and they block your airway. Um, or you can have even worse, a peritonsillar abscess, which um, is, is just really gross. And then you definitely get a TNA after that. So some assessment findings for uh, tonsillitis. Acute tonsillitis can be a mild, severe sore throat, uh, decreased food intake, um, difficulty swallowing, which is also called dysphagia, belly pain, vomiting, fever, swelling of the tonsils, tenderness of the lymph glands, which are below your jawline and around your upper neck area, uh, muscle and joint pain just from the whole infection, bacterial or viral cause, headache, malaise, pain that refers to the ears because this is an upper respiratory infection and it communicates with the sinuses through the oro and nasopharynx and then you can have an ear infection. Um, and a feeling of constriction in the back of the throat um, and excess secretions which uh, you either will drool or have a constant urge to swallow but you'll have some painful swallowing. And with chronic tonsillitis these kids will have a reoccurrent sore throat and uh, occasionally some purulent drainage in the tonsillar area so you'll have those uh, white pockets or sometimes gray or green pockets that kind of uh, has exudate which is also known as pus. So Usually to diagnose this, we will have a throat culture to try to figure out what caused it. And then you can pretty much treat with uh, antibiotics like penicillin um, or something like that.
usually uh, 10 to 14 days. And please remember to teach these families to take 100% of their antibiotics start to finish. Do not save them for their next illness, even whenever the child is feeling better. That is just the reason that we have superbugs these days. Um, so uh, let's see, penicillin for that, for chronic tonsillitis or development of any other complications, you'll probably get a tonsillectomy or a TNA, but you have to wait um, until they're infection free for like up to a month. So, you know, if they're having a really bad tonsil tonsillitis episode, we won't do a TNA right then and there for obvious reasons. And then any sort of comfort that you can do. So Tylenol or ibuprofen, um, lozenges, analgesics, antipyretics, things like that. So, so um, nursing interventions, um, if you're getting a tonsillectomy or your child's getting a tonsillectomy, this is going to go back to growth and development whenever you talked about children and uh, how they best learn or deal with situations or what their greatest fears are. So um, you're going to want to talk to the child if it's age appropriate. You're going to want to show them around, offer them um, a toy, have the parents bring a lovey or one of their favorite uh, comfort items with them. Encourage the parents to stay with the child, of course, because we're all about family-centered care. Um, Prepare the child for the sore throat. Let them know that they'll be able to have popsicles and ice and things like that afterwards. Um, you usually won't give them um, milk products, dairy products, or ice cream immediately after um, just because of the increased rate of mucus production with dairy products. Um, and then also, whenever you do give them popsicles and juice and things like that, uh, for the immediate post-operative period, I would kind of avoid giving them the red ones just because if they are bleeding or vomiting red, you need to know, is it blood, is it popsicle, what's going on? You can also ice the area around the neck with an ice collar for comfort. Um, do not give them any straws, sharp objects, forks, um, Doritos chips, nacho chips, anything that's going to scratch the back of their throat where they just had an incision, a straw because of that sucking kind of, um, that sucking force can also break uh, the sutures in the kid's, kid's throat. So. Um, monitor for signs and symptoms of dehydration postoperatively, monitor for bleeding. Um, kids that are bleeding or have busted stitches will have frequent swallowing. Um, they can vomit old blood or bright red blood. Just kind of keep an eye on them immediately after. And of course, control their pain. So let's talk upper respiratory tract infection, um, nasopharyngitis, also known as the common cold, which can pretty much be caused by a lot of things in children. The most common thing is R RSV or respiratory succinctal virus. Um, this can affect different kids different ways. Some kids just get the cold and they're fine. Other ones get admitted to the hospital. They need intubation um, and others um, do not make it. So it's we can never predict how these viruses and bacteria are going to affect any of our children. Um, so, you know, the, the best thing to do is prevention and uh, early, early diagnosis, management, and treatment. So let's go on to nasal pharyngitis, a.k.a. the common cold. So pharyngitis just means sore throat or sometimes called strep throat if it's caused by the strep bacteria. It's the most common infectious disease and typically benign and self-limiting. It can lead to secondary bacterial infections that need to be treated. Typically lasts four to 10 days, being the most contagious around two to three days. The kids that are admitted in the hospital with RSV, it gets a lot worse before it gets better and they're often there for quite a long time, up to two weeks. So who's at risk? Anybody, any of us that have uh, been out, touched anything in the past ever. So it's more common in kids just because they're more susceptible. They touch a lot more things and they just have a more uh, fragile immune system. Um, so let's see, there's uh, over 100 viruses that can cause it, but mostly we're talking about RSV, but it can be rhinovirus, coronavirus, um, adenovirus, Coxsackie virus, other things like that that I'm sure you're pretty uh, familiar with, um, influenza, para-influenza, things like that. So um, 
So what happens or how it's contracted is pretty much the organism gains entry into the upper respiratory tract via the mouth, usually hand-to-mouth contact or hand-to-nose or something like that. The organism grows and, you know, has baby organisms and starts a organism family. Um, and then your body recognizes it and responds that it's a stranger and that starts the whole inflammatory process. Um, which is also like another lecture that I absolutely love to give is immunity, but we'll get there. Anyway, so it's going to be in your upper respiratory tract. Symptoms are more severe in infants and children than they are in adults for obvious reasons because we're uh, more evolved in our immunity. Um, usually self-limiting, the kid uh, can get this up to six to nine times a year. So it's going to cause the sore throat, the nasal congestion, um, the sneezing, the headache, the burning watery eyes. They're going to have coughing usually from like the nasal discharge. Um, something important to note is I know it's very tempting to give kids cough suppressants, um, but try to hold off on that and maybe it's acceptable to give them at bedtime so they can sleep. But when you're giving a cough suppressant, basically what you're doing is you're allowing that mucus and that infectious, you know, slime to basically sit down in their, their lower airways and in their lungs, which can cause more issues. That can cause a pneumonia or, or, you know, bronchiolitis or things like that. So allow the child to cough things up. I know it's going to, you know, sound terrible and it's going to cause them to have a sore throat. We can treat those things. But unless it's bedtime, try to avoid the cough, cough suppressant medication. As far as diagnosis goes, um, it really depends on what the offending organism is. Uh, we do have rapid RSV tests and things like that, but they're, they're not that reliable. You can be RSV negative or flu negative and still have it. Um, so it's basically just looking at the signs and symptoms and kind of treating that. Um, you can also rule out allergies by doing allergy testing, which will also have a similar presentation. Medically, managing it, give uh, antipyretics, which are anti-fever drugs, to manage the fever and discomfort, and that can be Tylenol and ibuprofen. When I say ibuprofen, I'm meaning age-appropriate um, and, you know, medically appropriate. And Tylenol, medically appropriate as well. Do not give to, you know, kids with bleeding disorders or things like that. Also, I don't know if I need to mention this or not, but please do not give children aspirin. No ASA, please. Um, because if children have a viral illness, which you at home cannot tell if they're viral or bacterial, if they have a viral illness, and they can still have a viral illness while they have a bacterial illness, so just because you think they have strep throat that they're all bacterial, just do not give children aspirin because it can cause um, another complication called Rye syndrome, which we might talk about another time. Anyway, so give them uh, anti-fever medications, manage their discomfort, uh, obviously plenty of rest, plenty of fluids, decongestants to help decrease the swelling in the nasal passages so they can breathe better. Remember, if you're giving them any sort of mucus thinner to supplement their fluid intake, um, and you can give cough suppressant, just do it at bedtime so they rest well. Don't do it throughout the day because we do want to get that crap out. You want the kid to be in a comfortable position. Um, so, you know, if you need to provide cool mist or humidified air for them. I know back in the day we used to go sit in, uh, or our parents used to make us sit in like a hot steam room. That can be therapeutic, but we're finding that the cool, uh, moist air is more therapeutic because of the swelling and the edema. So think about, um, this is going to be bizarre, but think about sticking your kid's head uh, in front of the freezer door for a little while. Um, be careful if you think it's cold outside, then taking them outside because that air can be extremely dry and you can cause a bronchospasm as um, we just saw about three weeks ago in my hospital. So, and that was a very unfortunate um, incident that did not end well for, for that family. Uh, over the counter, you can buy saline nose drops um, just to kind of help keep those airways nice and moist. And it'll also help you suction out any of the dried crusty boogies um, make sure they have good fluid intake, rest, and all that fun stuff. All right, so we talked about nasopharyngitis, uh, which was the nasal passages and the throat, so the nose and the throat. Now let's talk about regular acute pharyngitis or sore throat. Strep throat can be a possibility if it's caused by bacterial infection.
So there's two types, viral, which um, is similar to bacterial, except for viral is going to be more bright red, more stripey, um, more painful. Bacteria, you're going to have the uh, white pockets or green pockets, the exudate or the pus coming out from that. Now, bacterial is usually caused by the group A beta hemolytic strep infection. Um, if this goes untreated, kids can get rheumatic fever, which is uh, damaging to the heart. They can also get kidney issues or renal problems. So um, if you notice that a child does have exudate or pus or white pockets from the back of the throat, do give them a full course of antibiotics and make sure that they can take that because this is not just a sore throat or a strep infection. It can lead to a lot worse things. So. Anyway, um, usually pharyngitis peaks between four and seven days. It can be bacterial or viral. If it's strep throat, it can lead to rheumatic fever or acute glomular nephritis, which is, um, I've been a nurse for over 10 years and I've never been able to say glomulus. But you guys know what that is. That's that thing in the kidney. But anyway, that was the renal problems that I was referring to whenever you do not treat a uh, a bacterial infection of GABS or group A beta hemolytic strep or strep throat. Um, so make sure they take their full course of antibiotics. Uh, throw away your toothbrush uh, once you've got that. Remember the bacteria will live on that toothbrush so get a new one. Um, they usually on antibiotics you'll need to stay home for 24 hours. Once you've done a 24 hour uh, course of antibiotics you can go back to school or work on your antibiotics. Um, Give those analgesics or anti-fever, antipyretic medications as needed. Don't share utensils or cups. That'll just spread it. Um, and make sure that you are uh, encouraging um, plenty of fluids. If it turns out it is viral and it does not have any exudate, it's uh, negative for, for strep. Um, basically, just with all viral infections, all you can do is treat the symptoms, and that is the antipyretics, the uh, pain reducers, plenty of fluids, and lots of rest. Let's talk about epiglottitis, which is a very serious and potentially even more serious and deadly emergency and airway inflammation. It's uh, inflammation, as it suggests, an edema of the epiglottis, which is the flap that can cover up your airway whenever you're swallowing food and water to prevent aspiration. It's caused by either the bacteria H. influenza, which there is a vaccine for that, or pneumococci, or the group A beta hemolytic streptococci. You know I love that gabs. It's everywhere. Um, so basically, it's a serious obstructive inflammatory process uh, of the cartilage of the epiglottis. Um, so most commonly occurs in kids age 2 to 7. The incidence has greatly decreased since we created that Hib or H influenza type B vaccine. Um, it happens really fast. It has an abrupt onset, rapidly progressive to respiratory distress, and needs immediate emergent medical attention. The laryngeal obstruction results from inflammation and edema of the epiglottis. It can rapidly progress to complete upper airway obstruction within two to five hours and requires prompt recognition and intervention. And you have to be very careful whenever you're assessing these children. These are the kids that you do not want to stick a tongue depressor down because if you touch that epiglottis or you cause this kid to cough or start choking, um, you can cause a spasm and this kid's airway can shut down completely. So these are the kids that you need to have an emergency crike kit or an emergency tracheostomy kit at the bedside if you suspect this. Um, so that's a, that's a complication, trach, respiratory um, compromise or respiratory emergency or even death. So these kids are going to come into the ED, they're going to be coughing a little bit, they're going to have difficult and painful swallowing, uh, fever, they're going to be like pushing their head out a little bit like a turtle, like extending their neck, trying to get as big of an airway as possible. They're going to be drooling from their mouth and have their mouth open, they're going to be mouth breathers because they can't swallow this because their epiglottis is so swollen. Again, we're going to have those retractions from breathing. We're going to have tachycardia, tachypnea, all those things that we talked about earlier slides um, for respiratory distress. Sore throat is obvious. We might even have strider with the breathing because of that, that swelling and that blocked airway. 
um, and they could be sitting in the tripod position and that would be them leaning over trying to support themselves and trying to make their airway as big as possible. Diagnosis is usually done by either an x-ray of the neck, which shows a really, really big epiglottis, or if you can visually inspect the throat without putting anything in there, you're going to see a large edematous bright red epiglottis. So basically have your emergency equipment at the bedside, emergency endotracheal tube or trache tracheostomy, definitely cool oxygen, cool mist tent or cool mist blow by. Um, IV fluids to prevent dehydration, and we're going to do a 10-day course of IV antibiotics, usually a cephalosporin unless the kid is allergic to penicillin. So some nursing interventions. Remember, don't put anything down this kid's throat. Try to limit the people in the room. You don't want this kid getting anxious or upset or start crying or screaming because, again, they can go into a spasm and close off their airway. Have your emergency equipment by the bedside. Know that you need to start an IV because you're going to do IV fluids. So try to get the kid as calm or distracted as possible so they don't scream. This is a nice uh, way to bring in child life or the TV or video games or stickers or something like that. Uh, use your Elemax or your Imla, your lidocaine cream to numb that area before placing the IV so you, again you're not triggering uh, a spasm for the kid. Um, Let's see, allow the kid to be close to the parent that's comforting to them, uh, monitor the vital signs, maintain oxygen status, pretty much give emotional support to the family and to the kid because this can be a pretty scary thing. Remember, it's caused by H. influenza or group A beta hemolytic strep. That's really, really the important thing to take away there. Abrupt onset, it is a medical emergency. They will drool. They will tripod. Whenever you take PALS class or pediatric advanced life support, epiglottitis is always one of those scenarios that's in there. All right, let's move on to some croup, which there are several different kinds of croup, but we'll just talk about basic croup. Um, so basically a severe inflammation and obstruction of the upper airway. Um, so basically in croup, inflammatory swelling and spasms can constrict the larynx, uh, which reduces airflow. Um, inflammatory changes completely obstruct the larynx and significantly narrow the trachea and from that that's where we're getting that uh, barking kind of seal like cough is because of the the airway restriction the narrowing of the airways it can be caused by uh, viral induced edema uh, parainfluenza adenovirus RSV influenza measles but two-thirds of the infection are paraflu, so majority of your croup is going to be paraflu. And remember, croup isn't the actual disease. Croup is just the name of the syndrome or the sickness that's caused by these viruses. Um, or can be caused by bacteria, so pertussis, which we'll, associate, we'll call whooping cough. Um, diphtheria, which we don't see too much of anymore, thank goodness, because of vaccinations. And mycoplasma, which is a super common one that we get from airplanes. So basically, you can have spasmodic laryngitis, which is just the attacks of the laryngeal obstruction. Um, that's more common at night, so you'll see a lot of these kids get these coughing spells at night. Uh, you can have obstructive laryngitis, which is from the swelling, and that's the narrowing of the upper airway from, and, uh, from vocal cord edema. You can have uh, LTB, or acute laryngeotracheal bronchitis, and that's the inflammation of the mucus of the larynx and the trachea, which inflammation causes swelling and that restricts your airway. So again, croup comes in many different flavors and sizes and many different causes. Uh, this usually affects boys more than girls and usually happens between three months and five years of age and typically happens in the winter. Um, and it's super common in kids that are born premature. So some clinical manifestations, the barking cough or the seal-like cough um, usually begins with cold symptoms for one or two days, gets worse at night, can last up to a week, usually five or six days. Um, you can have decreased breath sounds and crackles, um, which means that it's moved down from the upper airway into the bronchus. Uh, you'll have increased work of breathing, shortness of breath, uh, you can have accessory muscle use, inspiratory strider because of that swelling of the airways.
um, muffled vocal sounds. Uh, we'll diagnose it by doing throat cultures if it's bacterial. Otherwise, we'll rule it out by signs and symptoms and call it viral. Uh, you can get a laryngoscope, but that's uh, not too common. But that would Im reveal inflammation and obstruction of that area. Or you get a neck, uh, neck x-ray, yikes, a neck x-ray. And uh, that's going to show upper airway narrowing and edema around the, the subglottic folds. So... Basically, management-wise, cool, humidified air during sleep, cool mist tent or blow-by, a uh, room humidifier if they're at home, not a hot one, a cold one. Um, expose the child to cool, moist air. This is like that freezer that we were talking about, opening the freezer door. Administer oxygen if necessary. Um, again, treat with medications, the antipyretics, the Tylenol, ibuprofen. Um, if it's super bad, the swelling is incredibly bad and they're at risk for having like a spasmodic attack, they can get like inhaled racemic epi, um, corticosteroids to help with the swelling like methylpred or solumedrol, um, antibiotics if it's bacterial, IV fluids if they're dehydrated, and if they have a, an emergency airway issue where they have like a spasm um, and their airway closes up similar to that epiglottitis, um, with any one of these spasmodic or, or bronchitis, uh, laryngitis, anything like that, make sure we have a tracheostomy or an ET tube um, ready for them to, to guarantee an airway. So this is just a review of the treatment plan that we just talked about. Um, other things to think about is keeping the child calm. Again, like we talked about with the epiglottitis, you don't want to get them worked up. You don't want them screaming or crying because that can increase the risk of having an airway spasm. Um, make sure that their air is humidified and cool. Encourage liquids. Um, frequently assess respiratory and cardiac status, pulse ox, monitor vital signs because remember children can compensate for a really long time and then they just hit a wall. Um, and the majority of pediatric codes are respiratory in nature. Provide support to the family and to the child. Um, and if you're giving uh, steroids and epis, um, inhaled epis, make sure you're talking to the parents about the side effects of those, that their child is going to become a crazy beast, that the solumedrol or the methylpred is going to make them very angry. It'll probably make them hungry and uh, mood swingy, and that the epi, the racemic epi, the inhaled epis, or albuterols are going to definitely make them uh, very hyper. They're going to have a faster heart rate things of that. Make sure you're preparing uh, the parents for, for everything. This is just another croup. Uh, remember, croup is a generalized term for the different types of uh, upper respiratory tract infections that cause that barking cough. And like I mentioned before, LTB or laryngotracheobronchitis is inflammation of the mucosal lining of the larynx and the trachea, which causes the restricted uh, airway. Um, treatments and everything like that is the same as prior croup slides. Pertussis or whooping cough is again another uh, croup. Um, it is um, actually making a comeback because of people not vaccinating their children. There is a vaccine for this bacteria caused by Bordetella pertussis. Um, also known in puppies as kennel cough, if anybody's ever had a, a puppy uh, from the shelter that had a cough. But anyway, um, yeah, so it's coming back because uh, people aren't immunizing their kids and it can kill them. So usually happens in spring and summer, super contagious, um, basically get vaccinated. I'm not sure what else to say. These kids will get admitted to the hospital for... Uh, IV antibiotics um, for up to two weeks, lots of fluids. Um, they'll definitely get intubated um, and they may or may not um, live. So um, that's it. And I think that sums up the croup so we can move on. So for the most part in the upper airway infections, we were talking about a lot of mucous membranes, except for the epiglottis, which is um, you know, still pretty floppy. And now we're going to move to the lower airways, and this is going to be a lot more cartilage, um, a little bit 
differently shaped in children than is uh, than it is in adults. Um, it's not fully developed. It's uh, definitely at high risk for spasming and for closing off. It's more narrow, um, so edema and inflammation can uh, close off the airway. So let's talk about uh, infection of the lower airways. First up is acute bronchitis. So this is inflammation of the bronchus, which is the upper airway before uh, we branch off into the lungs. Um, definitely at risk if you've had a recent upper respiratory tract infection because this can make its way down, uh, common in influenza. Kids who live with smokers have a chronic irritant um, to this area. Um, other respiratory irritants like uh, people who cook meth, they definitely will have kids at risk for uh, bronchitis. Um, allergens, pollen, if kids are allergic to pets, pet dander, anything like that can be a respiratory irritant. Dust, um, so you know, things like stuffed animals and stuff like that can uh, trigger bronchitis. Um, kids that are weak, debilitated, malnourished, so any kids that have a comorbidity like cerebral palsy um, or anything else that keeps them from being completely mobile um, or children that are immunocompromised. So basically this is just an inflammatory process that leads to swelling and mucus production and because these airways are super narrow, swelling and mucus production completely closes off our airway and makes breathing incredibly hard. Um, our body naturally tries to respond by clearing its airway by coughing and spasming, but that can just oftentimes make it worse because that's um, more of an irritant. So these kids are going to have uh, fever, dry hacking, non-productive cough that worsens at night and becomes productive in two to three days because the inflammation and the swelling happen first before the mucus production. Mucus production and secretions usually happen to try to protect an inflamed, irritated airway. So these kids will have like this dry cough and then the body's like, oh my gosh, this is so dry and harsh, it's hurting my insides, let me produce the secretion of mucus to protect my airways, because that's what I do, but then, you know, it further clogs up your airways. Um, chest congestion, tightness, uh, weakness, fever. You can have uh, symptoms for up to 10 days, but I mean, anybody who's had bronchitis knows that a cough can per persist for weeks, four to six weeks. Um, so usually a month is, is uh, pretty common. So what to do? Treat it like we do everything else. Rest fluids, treat your symptoms with anti-fever, antipyretic, and uh, pain relievers, and give them a cough expectorant. Let's get that mucus out. All right, let's get down to bronchiolitis, which is inflammation and obstruction of the bronchioles. This is lower airways below the bronchi. Uh, when the bronchus splits into the two and starts heading into the lungs and creates more branches, that's our bronchioles. So this is a lower respiratory tract in infants usually, primarily. Um, the main cause, I see this a lot right now in the hospital, is RSV or the respiratory succinctal virus. Other causes can be paraflu, adenovirus, and influenza. Um, basically what happens is the bronchial mucosa gets super swollen, um, we have this dry hacking cough, so the lumens or the bronchioles fill with exudate or pus or secretions because the body is responding to the inflammation, to the irritation, to the mucosa. Um, so then the bronchi and the bronchial walls get infiltrated with inflammatory cells epithelial cells, so there's mucus, there's swelling, there's inflammation, lots of stuff is going on there. Um, and then any, whenever you get a chest x-ray, you can see like parabronchial and interstitial kind of infiltrates on the x-ray for those of you that work in uh, the hospitals or radiology. So some complications is obviously respiratory issues, respiratory distress and insufficiency because of the swelling and obstructive airway. Um, Assessment-wise, uh, you can see these kids that are going to maybe try pursed lips, try kind of blowing out their air because they can have air trapping because they're going to be able to inhale. Um, but because of all the swelling in the mucus, the air can possibly get trapped in the lower airways. They might have sternal retractions, uh, increased work of breathing, that's accessory muscles, nasal flaring, tachypnea, lots of mucus. Initially, for the first two days, um, 
this is just going to present just like a regular cold with a heavy cough. It's going to get worse before it gets better. These kids can wheeze. They can um, kind of have like coughing fits. Initially, it may not produce phlegm because of all the swelling and the tightness, um, but they can sound congested or have nasal congestion. Uh, we'll do an RSV culture, and like I said, those aren't always very, um, they're not very, very accurate. So sometimes you can be RSV negative, and the next culture can be RSV positive. We'll get a chest x-ray, and we'll begin to medically manage these kids. So medically, these kids are going to need humidified oxygen, as many of the other kids do, IV fluids to prevent um, uh, dehydration. They're going to need to be isolated because of whatever caused their bronchiolitis, the RSV or the flu or the paraflu or the adeno. Um, they'll need to get medication. They'll probably need inhaled epi or um, anything like that to help with their airways, maybe steroids to help with inflammation, pretty much similar treatments to what we talked about in the past. Um, and then, you know, reduce triggers, secondhand smoke, allergens, things like that. You may have uh, heard of something called Synergis or uh, Pelivizumab, which is a, um, a vaccination. This uh, isn't given to every young child to prevent um, RSV. It's not like it's a regular vaccination. This is usually just given to high-risk infants, and there's qualifications for it. So if you're preemie, if you've had a history of, you know, like lung disease or something like that, um, it's super expensive. You have to get it uh, quite frequently. So um, not a lot of kids will get the synergist unless they're at risk. Uh, nursing wise, monitor your vital signs, your pulse acts, um, keep your kid comfortable, keep the family comfortable, educate them on your precautions, you know, your glove gowns, hand washing, all that stuff. Make sure that your kid is a good respiratory and cardiac wise. Um, give them oxygen, IV fluids, IV uh, treatments, whatever they need, steroids. Um, and that's, that's pretty much it. It gets worse before it gets better, and they can be in the hospital for up to a couple weeks. So it's, it's uh, pretty challenging for the families. Okie dokie, pneumonia, and we're halfway there. Oh, time flies when you're having fun, let me tell you. So pneumonia, some of you may be familiar with this, had this, it happens in adults, and pretty much it's the same thing in children. Um, kids uh, are more at risk, obviously, because they're immature respiratory system and immune system. So it happens more frequently in infancy and early childhood. It's uh, typically a secondary illness, so they'll get something else first, and then it'll progress to pneumonia. Um, usually in kids that have already a compromised respiratory condition, whether it's from a comorbidity of them having like a, a mobility disease, blah, mobility disease like a cerebral palsy or something like that, or they're wheelchair bound, or because they had another illness that caused rep respiratory compromise. Um, so basically a pathogen invades the lower respiratory tract. It can be bacterial, viral, and it can even be fungal, which uh, is not very common at all. But viral is the most common in kids, you know, because there's viruses everywhere and kids like to pick them up. So uh, basically your body has this immune response, an antigen antibody response, which we'll talk about or you probably have already talked about in your immune lecture and your body releases endotoxins. So um, down in those little tiny alveoli, those little tiny air sacs where air exchange happens, they become filled up with fluid because of the endotoxin, because of the inflammation, and uh, red blood cells. So fluid and red blood cells accumulate, and then you get pus or exudate. And because of all that, then you aren't able to properly kind of aerate and do your gas exchange. Um, and so pneumonia is the kind of clogging up of the lower airway. You're un, um, unable to do gas exchange, which is why you kind of feel short of breath, tired, weak. Um, you're not able to kind of um, breathe and, and aerate and oxygenate as well as, as you were whenever you were a healthy person. And then because of the eggs you date in those alveolar sacs, those small little tiny sacs, you do have uh, the presence of lung sounds anywhere from uh, crackles to just kind of diminished lung sounds and 
and this uh, filling of these sacs we like to call atelectasis. So the alveoli become airless because of all the pus and then you get poor perfusion and poor ventilation. And then your lung tissue consolidates and then you get these white patchy infiltrates on x-ray. Um, so yeah, it's kind of that thing. It also can happen to ch uh, children or adults that are already admitted into the hospital with something else that aren't moving around, they're not mobile and they're not doing deep breathing. Um, that kind of uh, can increase the risk of pneumonia as well. So with these kids, you're going to see fever um, pretty high usually because this is way down into the deep parts of the lungs, so the body gets pretty mad about it. Uh, you're going to have cough. It can be unproductive or productive with some sputum. Uh, tachypnea, crackles or decreased breath sounds, diminished breath sounds in the bases. Um, the dullness with percussion. Now, I myself have never, as a nurse, done percussion on uh, lungs, um, but I know whenever you take a health assessment, you have to learn how to do all those crazy things. So normally, your airways would be a, like a nice hollow, echoey sound whenever you do the percussion. Obviously, because this is full of exudate, pus, things like that, fluid, you're going to have more of a dull sound. Retractions, nasal flaring, or accessory muscle use, um, irritability, restlessness, because restlessness, of course, is one of your initial signs of uh, respiratory distress. Um, vomiting and diarrhea are always possible because these are kids and it's respiratory. Um, decreased PO intake or, or not eating as much, um, as well as decreased fluid intake as well. So what to do, how to treat, basically the same as uh, prior, humidified oxygen, oxygen if they need it, otherwise humidified air, um, suctioning to uh, minimize secretions, chest physiotherapy that we were talking about with the cupped hands, or you can use the soft face mask to really kind of break apart the mucus down in those lower, lower airways. Um, also, this is a time whenever you can get these kids to try to really expand their lower lungs. Kids don't want to take big deep breaths, they're shallow breathers. So you can give them bubbles, you can give them pinwheels, um, anything to, to help kind of um, use their lung capacity. Uh, sometimes if you don't have those things, you can give them straws and wad up pieces of paper and take their, you know, nursing bedside table and play like a little straw hockey with them so they're having to blow through the straw. That causes them to take bigger breaths and to also really expel the air that's trapped in there. Um, so that's kind of a way around uh, doing some uh, some incentive spirometry is what we would call it. So um, if it's bacterial, antibiotics, obviously. Um, if it's viral, just fluids and rests. Make sure they're hydrated, small frequent feedings. These kids are not going to want to get full up on food. Um, and then, of course, your analgesics and antipyretics, your Tylenol and ibuprofen. So we're going to talk about BPD, or bronchopulmonary dysplasia. Um, if you um, are familiar with this, then you or someone you know probably had a premature baby. So BPD, bronchopulmonary dysplasia, is a chronic lung disease that begins in infancy. Um, pretty much happens because when babies are born that have immature lungs or some other disease or comorbidity and they require vent support, um, that vent support provides high positive pressure um, in their airway and uh, usually high high FiO2 or uh, fractionated inspiratory oxygen um, sort of uh, basically your 100% oxygen, 21% oxygen, that. Uh, so the combination of the positive pressure, ventilation, and oxygen in the first few weeks of life cause irreversible damage to the lungs. Um, there's possibly some genetic factors involved but we're not certain and prematurity is definitely a risk because of the lungs. Um, so basically what happens is it's uh, defined as an acute insult to the neonate's lungs. It requires positive pressure ventilation and high concentration over time. Um, so the oxygen and the positive pressure cause it and also it, uh, it, it's one of the treatments. Um, so respiratory distress syndrome, pneumonia, meconium, aspiration, all these things can cause and bring about uh, BPD. Basically, the therapies that we use to help it, uh, the ventilation, basically result in tissue and cellular injury and damage to the bronchial uh, epithelium in the lungs.
Uh, basically, the uh, ciliary bodies, the hairs, and I know we didn't talk about that when we were talking about the structure, but inside your uh, respiratory system and uh, along the linings are these tiny little hairs called ciliaries. And what they do is they move in an upward fashion that helps bring mucus from your lower airway to your upper airway so you can expectorate. Um, but uh, with BPD, the ciliary bodies, the ciliaries are, are damaged and their activity is inhibited. So kids have trouble clearing mucus with that. Um, recovery usually occurs in 6 to 12 months, but the kid can remain ventilator dependent for years. They can need a trach, or if they're ever readmitted to the hospital for anything, they might uh, require a, a long, long ventilator support. Right now in my cardiac ICU, I have uh, several kids that are former preemies that have BPD that we're having a really hard time getting off the vent. Uh, we're doing CPAP runs and stuff like that. And, and when we do get them off the vent, they still require like a high flow nasal cannula. So complications of BPD or respiratory insufficiency, obviously lower respiratory tract infections, hypertension, and death. Um, so whenever you listen to these kids, you're going to listen, you know, hear crackles, wheezes, atelectasis, kind of that crunchy, um, rice crispy sound, um, even diminished lower, uh, lower airway. Um, if they don't have ventilator assistance, they'll have uh, hypoxia, and that's because they need that positive pressure to push open their airways to make sure that uh, ventilation is occurring. Um, these kids are going to have delayed muscle growth. They're going to be weak. I mean, they're going to be pretty wimpy. They'll have cyanosis, uh, prolonged capillary fill time, respiratory distress. They can have right-sided heart failure because of the lung involvement, um, accessory muscle use, retractions, just kind of the whole shebang. So with the BPD, like we were talking about, your top four assessment findings are going to be atelectasis, crackles, uh, dyspnea or shortness of breath, sternal retractions, or accessory muscle use. Um, you're going to see pulmonary changes on your x-ray. Um, you'll see like a metaplasia or hyperplasia, so the lungs will be shaped a little bit differently or they'll have thickening um, in certain areas, and uh, interstitial fibrosis, so you can see some opacity or um, I'm not an excellent x-ray reader, but um, the physicians and radiologists will be able to see this for you. Um, so basically, trying to manage it, uh, chest physiotherapy, continued ventilatory, uh, ventil <laughs> ventilatory support. Sometimes, um, like I said, if we do get these kids off of a ventilator or and not trached, they, they kind of like that positive uh, pressure, so like a high-flow nasal cannula or something like that. They're really challenging to get off the, the flow, really, not as much the oxygen as the flow. Um, because of all their um, work of breathing and challenge uh, in ventilation and oxygenation, they might be nutritionally um, kind of in a deficit, so they might need parental nutrition or enteral nutrition, whether through an NG, a G tube, a PEG, a GJ, a jejunal tube, or through um, very, very rarely a PICC line uh, for TPN would they go home with that. Normally it's going to be through a regular feeding tube. Uh, medications, supportive measures, uh, bronchodilators, diuretics to kind of keep the fluid out of the lungs. Um, basically stuff like that. So as a nurse, just keep them comfortable, keep them ventilated, keep them oxygenated, perform that chest therapy, suction them out, keep them comfortable, educate the parents, um, and all that fun stuff. So uh, SIDS, I'm not sure if uh, you'll be tested on it, but here it is, just a, a quick overview. It's the third leading cause of death in infants one month to one year of age. It peaks between two and four months of age, 96 percent of cases occur before six months. Um, babies who are born to moms less than 20 years old are at risk. Uh, low birth weight infants, premature infants, uh, infants of multiple pregnancies, family history of SIDS, maternal smoking, um, mis malposition during sleeping, so like on the belly or prone, BPD or bronchopulmonary dysplasia that we just talked about, all those things put uh, the kids at risk of SIDS. We don't know exactly what causes it, um, and it's it's really not something that can be diagnosed. It's really more of a rule out after the baby has died and they do an autopsy. They kind of rule out everything else and decide that it's SIDS. 
Um, so we do know some things that can help prevent, and that is um, not keeping the baby warm. So uh, not putting a bunch of blankets in there. Don't keep their room warm. Uh, keep uh, the temperature kind of in a cooler state. Sometimes they suggest pacifiers to help stimulate the suck and breathing reflex. Um, you know, just, it's it's a, a unexplained thing, and we're just trying to find ways to reduce the risk. So. Okie dokie. Now let's talk about asthma. Um, so this is uh, basically obstructive pulmonary disease uh, all throughout the lungs. Um, it can be caused by uh, hyper-responsiveness of the lower airway. It can be unknown cause or um, kind of intrinsic. It can be caused by a reaction to an allergen. It can be caused by exercise or an environmental change. Um, basically, uh, the obstructive symptoms of asthma are caused by three things, inflammation in the mucous membranes, smooth muscle bronchospasm, and increased mucus secretion leading to airway obstruction and air trapping. So it's, it's, a, it's like the perfect storm. Unfortunately, it's a little bit of everything. Not only do you have the swelling, but then you've got the spasming, which further narrows the airways, and then you clog up those already narrowed air, airways with um, mucus. So um, you have a lot of the air trapping in here where you're able to get the air in, but it's hard to get it out. So obviously a risk of death with this and respiratory insufficiency, respiratory distress. These kids are going to have alteration in their chest um, because of the chronic air trapping. So remember how we talked about earlier, a normal adult chest is more wide than it is thick, but babies are more round. Kids that have a severe asthma are going to have a bit more barrel chest, and it's because of the air trapping. Um, they are, could be sweaty, uh, short of breath, exercise intolerance, fatigue, basically anything that you can imagine with having a severe, severe lung disease. Because of all the swelling and the mucus, these kids will have a cough. It'll have a hard time kind of clearing that cough as well. Um, so they can have decreased O2 sat on their pulse ox. Their blood gas um, can show high uh, CO2. Um, they can have allergies. Uh, this, if you get a sputum analysis, it rules out any other infection. It's just the asthma. The chest x-ray will show kind of like hyperinflated areas because of the air trapping. Um, and then ultimately you can do a PFT or a pulmonary function test and that'll indicate that they have air trapping and um, decreased expiratory flow or inability to really breathe out as much as they breathe in. So medical management, chest physiotherapy after the edema has resolved and the edema will resolve with uh, probably like some steroids, inhaled steroids, IV steroids. Um, give them plenty of fluids to thin out these mucus secretions, oxygen therapy if they need it, uh, bronchodilators, long term is going to be the mast cell stabilizer, so the chromalin um, kind of medications, um, anticholinergics like Atrovent, uh, leukotriene modifiers like the Singulair, um, things like that. Reduce the allergens in their environment. If it's exercise induced, then you know exercise in moderation. Um, dry air, cold air, dust, sand, things like that. Um, you really want them to be in a, in a kind of an arid climate. Um, just finding the triggers and reducing them. Also taking it seriously. Many people don't take asthma seriously, and it is a really, really dangerous disease. Um, I mean, your airway gets hyperactive and clogged, and you're unable to breathe. So basically, you're drowning in, in your own secretions, and you're unable to, to inspire or to ventilate. So um, taking it seriously, making sure that these uh, kids have their inhalers, their emergency or first acting inhalers on them at all time, um, in their sports bag, in for school, in the car, anywhere like that. Um, and then also educating them on doing their PFTs. Um, in the next, I think, slide or two, we'll look at um, kind of home ways that you can see where you are as far as having an asthma attack and what treatments you need to do and whether or not you need to come into the hospital.
So on the previous slide, we see a kid doing a nebulizer, um, and he's doing it himself. And that's a home nebulizer that uh, some asthma kids will have. Um, and on this slide, we see a couple examples of the spacers or the aero chambers for the puffers. You'll see the asthma inhaler puffer at the end of that one with the little girl or boy. I don't know what that is. Um, and uh, it's good to note that kids as young as four can use the, the puffer as long as they have a spacer or a chamber. Um, it makes it a lot easier for them to use. Um, also nursing wise, just keep these kids comfortable, keep them aerated, assess their cardiac and respiratory status, assess their peak flow uh, rates or their um, PFTs, uh, pulmonary functions. Um, maintain a calm environment, educate the family, identify the triggers, things like that. This is a, a couple examples of peak flow meters and basically when you're diagnosed with asthma or reactive airway disease, whatever the case may be, your physician is going to have you do actual in-hospital or in-office peak flow tests and that is whenever you're not having an asthma attack, whenever you're at your healthiest, they're going to ask you to do these kind of breathing exercises and blow into these machines and they're going to get a level and it's going to be your ideal level of what you can blow out after you've taken a deep breath. So then once they've got that level, then they work out um, what we'll see in the next slide, your red, yellow, and green zone. Um, so if you are, or if your child rather, is outside or inside and they're feeling an asthma attack coming on or they're just having difficulty breathing, you can give them this peak flow meter. You can ask them to give it the best breath they can and you look at the number that they've blown and then you look at their individualized red, yellow, green chart and you see where they are. Um, and in the next slide you'll see if they're you know in the green and they don't have any signs or symptoms they're good they're able to to perform normal activities do whatever they were um, you're fine if you're in the yellow they'll say um, you're coughing you're wheezing your peak flow is diminished um, take a rest take um, you know a puffer an inhaler have a nebulizer something like that call your doctor um, and then if you're really having low peak flows and a lot of signs and symptoms, you'd probably be in the red zone and it would suggest that you take your uh, quick acting inhaler right now on the way to the hospital, call your MD, you know, get in right away for um, more, more um, in-depth treatments. Status asthmaticus is a true medical emergency. It happens when the hypoxia of asthma worsens, um, your expiratory flow or the amount that you can breathe out slows, and uh, you're not able to really clear your lungs. Um, so there's no air movement when you're listening to these kids, uh, which is obviously a very dangerous sign. Um, it's an emergent situation. Um, and you want to get them uh, BiPAP or CPAP or some sort of positive pressure um, airway kind of um, ventilation. Uh, it's, I want to say intubate them if you need to. I mean, obviously, in a life or death situation, you'll want to put a breathing tube in. But when you intubate an asthma kid, they are very, very challenging to extubate. Their lungs become in, like completely dependent on that ventilator. Um, so, status asthmaticus is, uh, you know, if kids aren't responding to our normal uh, inhaled uh, albuterols, corticosteroids, they might need a mag drip or something like that to help relax their airways. Um, it, basically, they're not pro uh, responding to our normal asthma treatment. So, this is definitely emergency um, and take it, take it very seriously. In my experience, reactive airway disease, or RAD, is something that we, uh, we say kids less than three that have asthma symptoms have. So kids, you know, at a younger age are too hard to uh, diagnose asthma in because of the way that we need to do the pulmonary function test and stuff like that. So we usually just call them a reactive airway disease. Um, not all reactive airway disease will develop into asthma, though, but most kids younger than three... Um, usually uh, who we's are diagnosed with RAD. Um, only 30% though go on to develop asthma. Uh, usually kids at risk are the ones who are exposed to environmental tobacco smoke, um, especially during pregnancy. So like even when moms are pregnant, if they're smoking, 
um, that they have an increased risk of having a baby with uh, RAD. Um, African Americans and Hispanics are at an increased risk. Um, infection, uh, those who get RSV, mycoplasma, they're at an increased risk to get reactive airway disease. So uh, a third of children, though, um, are significantly affected by it. Uh, I think it causes 13 million visits a year or something like that and a few hundred thousand hospitalizations. So thank goodness to uh, good medications, though, uh, steroids, IV fluids, that we are ha the mortality is decreasing. All right, good. I'm glad I have one last slide to sum up asthma. Um, Let's see, chronic inflammatory disorder, response to triggers from a variety of sources. Um, 4,000 people die from asthma every year. Um, people who live in large urban areas, uh, inner city, um, which has an increased risk for exposure to environmental pollutants, they're at a higher risk for asthma. Um, exposure to secondhand smoke, respiratory tract infections in childhood, having one or both parents with asthma, low birth weight, obesity, um, gastroesophageal reflux disease, or GERD, is a, a risk factor for asthma. Um, boys are twice as more likely than girls to get asthma. Exposure to um, paint, plastic, steel, electronic manufacturing, all those kind of chemicals if you live in an industrial area near that. Um, let's see, uh, those are the risk factors, um, and what happens is you're exposed to those things, uh, you have abnormal antibodies that are produced, they produce mast cells, the whole, like, inflammation, histamine, leukotrienes, the swelling, and the mucus, we already talked about that, um, I think that is close to summing it up. Um, can be associated with allergic reactions. A lot of kids, um, that reminds me, asthma, allergies, and eczema are kind of this triad that are often associated with one another. Um, so if you have, you know, a child with asthma, check for the eczema and allergies um, and vice versa. If you have a kid with eczema, you know, screen them respiratory wise. Um, I think, I think that's it. All right, moving on. All right, moving on to cystic fibrosis. When I first started out, I was actually on a cardiopulmonary floor, so I got a lot of lung transplants and a lot of CFRs. Um, and uh, that was a while back, so I'm glad that medicine is getting better and that these kids are actually living into adulthood. So CF is uh, basically a lot of people associate it with strictly a pulmonary disease, but it's... Uh, it starts out in the GI tract because it's a dysfunction of the exocrine glands, which kind of falters the way that we produce um, mucus and secretions. Um, so they get super thick, very, very thick. And so that messes up, obviously, your GI system and prevents these kids from absorbing nutrients. But it also clogs up their respiratory system. Um, so those are the two major systems that it affects. Uh, it is genetic. It's autosomal recessive, so one of the most common inherited diseases in kids and one of the most common causes of childhood death. Um, so research, I think, is pointing to a possibility that there's about 300 genes associated with it. Um, let's see. Most common in uh, Caucasians or whites. Um, Basically, what happens is the disease um, messes up the way that we produce mucus, um, and it also inhibits the release of pancreatic enzymes, which is why these kids also have to take enzymes with every meal and every snack. Um, so we have thick mucus in our lungs and uh, thick mucus in our gut, and without the pancreatic enzymes, we're also unable to to digest and, and absorb our foods. So um, what happens is uh, they have respiratory insufficiency, uh, nutritional deficits, and then ultimately death. So assessment-wise, bulky, greasy, foul-smelling stools, and it, it is so true. Um, it can also be called steatorrhea. Um, they're very pale, they're very fatty, they're, um, it's just a bizarre kind of looking stool. Lots of uh, undigested foods. These kids are going to have thin arms and legs, but a big old belly, um, big distended stomach. Kind of like that standard malnutrition look. Uh, 
uh, failure to thrive from malabsorption. They're going to have a chronic productive cough, reoccurrent respiratory infections. Um, Pseudomonas is the most common infection that they get. But anything that happens to make its way into their lungs is incredibly dangerous to these kids because, like I said, their lungs are clogged up with mucus. So anything that gets in there is really, really challenging to get out. So the actual like complicated patho of it is um, there's a transport protein um, that interferes with chloride channels, which is why one of the diagnose, uh, diagnostic tests we use is a chloride sweat test. Um, but anyway, so that gene is kind of mutated, which prevents ATP. I'm taking it way back whenever I talk about ATP. I'm sure you guys remember that from uh, uh, A&P or maybe even bio or chem or something. But it prevents ATP from binding um, with protein. And so basically the epithelia in the airways and the intestines are affected. Um, the salt absorbing epithelia are affected in the sweat duct. So whenever you get the chloride sweat test, there's a high, high, um, high amount of uh, salt in the sweat. Um, I think two to five times the normal levels of sodium and chloride, because remember salt is sodium chloride. Um, and so the kids get dehydrated, there's an increased viscosity of mucus glands, and then they get obstruction, um, and uh, it's, it's pretty tragic. So um, they, have a, they have an increased appetite because obviously they're not uh, getting the nutrition that they need because of the blocked um, GI system, the blocked mucus ducts. We put them on a high-fat, high-protein diet, um, but when you're doing high-fat and high-protein, uh, you're also doing high calorie and high sugar, incidentally, but not on purpose. So a lot of these kids end up getting some sort of diabetes. Um, chest x-rays show signs of obstructive lung disease because of the mucus. Um, they'll have a sweat, like I said, a chloride sweat test. Um, I don't know if you'll need to know it, but uh, it'll show that their level is greater than 60 millicues. Um, they'll have a stool specimen sent. Um, DNA testing, um, and also parents can be screened um, for, for this gene before they have children. Uh, they'll have pulmonary function tests or PFTs that show that they have a decreased vital capacity or lung capacity. Um, liver enzymes will show hepatic insufficiency. Like I said, they can possibly be diabetic. They'll have sputum cultures that'll show that they're growing all kinds of funk, uh, staph or, or pseudomonas or anything like that. Um, they'll have electrolyte imbalances because of absorption issues, um, just all sorts of things, unfortunately. So medically, um, we give them pancreatic enzymes with every single bite that they take, every meal, every snack, everything like that. Um, they get the fat-soluble vitamins, the ADEX, you should know those already, A, D, E, and K supplements. And K supplement is not potassium, it is vitamin K, there is a difference. Uh, chest physiotherapy. A lot of these kids that I used to take care of, they would come into the hospital every couple months for two-week admission, and it would be called a clean-out. And that would be two weeks of ventil ventilation, um, inhaled therapies, chest physiotherapy, lots of suction, PD. So PD, postural drainage, is a bit different from chest physiotherapy. This you actually position the child in different ways, laying on their side, angled kind of, you know, head down a little bit to really, really use gravity in helping get these secretions and mucus out. Uh, bronchodilators, mucolytics. Um, I don't know if anybody has had the pleasure of smelling acetylcysteine, a kind of inhaled mucolytic. It is. Uh, it smells like skunk. It's absolutely disgusting, but it, it liquefies secretions. Uh, Pulmazyme, anything like that, these kids are going to get aerosol nebs. Um, make sure they are incredibly hydrated. Um, let's see, high protein formula, like we talked about, a lot of them will have feeding tubes and supplemental feedings. Oxygen therapy is needed. These kids really enjoy feeling the positive pressure or the flow, so they would love, they love to have nasal cannula with like upwards of four, five, six liters. Um, let's see. Uh, we try not to give these kids antihistamines because if any of you have ever taken an antihistamine during allergy season, you know it dries you out, and we do not want to get these kids dry. Um, and then ultimately, they will get lung transplants, but because this is a genetic disease, um, the lungs uh, 
we will implant them into the child or transplant them into the child, but um, you know, the CF, the cystic fibrosis is still there. So the lungs do have a shelf life. It's only a matter of time before they again uh, begin to get clogged up with the mucus. So nursing-wise, um, lots and lots of education. I mean, this is a lifetime disease. If they miss their medications, if they don't take care of themselves nutritionally, if they don't take their enzymes, I mean, it can have detrimental effects. If they do get a transplant and they don't take their anti-rejection medications, again, you can have detrimental effects. So um, make sure they're educated on their enzymes, that they have plenty of them, high-calorie, high-protein foods, um, multivitamins, the ADEX, the ADE and K, lots of pulmonary hygiene at home, um, teach parents to, uh, you know, keep their kids nutritionally sound, hydrated, make sure to avoid allergens and triggers and bacterias, no birds in the house. Um, I had a kid, you know, whenever I worked in St. Louis, Missouri, uh, there was a lot of caves around there. And the kid went in, you know, went outside to go play and went into a bunch of caves and ended up with histoplasmosis because he went into a bat cave. So, uh, you know, just kind of be mindful of, of your environment. Um, a lot of these kids will get antibiotics, IV antibiotics, because of uh, infections that are able to get into those lungs. Um, Encourage genetic counseling for the family because this happens, um, I think I can't even remember if it's one in four or two out of four or whatever of your children. So if you continue to have children, you will continue to pass it on to them um, as far as like a recessive gene. But, um, uh, you know, you do have a risk of them actually having active cystic fibrosis and not just carrying the gene on with them. Normally, I would put this in um, a different lecture. I would put it in childhood trauma, accidents, and burns, but it's going to go here. Um, so smoke inhalation injury. Um, so you have a kid that was exposed to a fire. He doesn't look like he's damaged at all. He's, you know, skin's fine and everything like that. You still need to examine his mouth. Open up his mouth and examine. Is it bright red? Is it dark? Does it have soot? Is it singed? Are his eyebrows missing? is his nose hair missing um, and then also take a look at his lungs because this is kind of like a silent killer um, smoke inhalation or even like heat inhal inhalation these can cause a kind of emergent flash pulmonary edema smoke inhalation um, a lot of kids that are in fires the fire doesn't even get to them in the house they just die of inhaling the smoke and what happens is the carbon dioxide or carbon monoxide depends on what's burning um, it kind of uh, takes up the space of, um, well, carbon monoxide specifically binds to hemoglobin and prevents your oxygen to binding to that. But the carbon dioxide uh, dissolves in your blood and uh, kind of what it does is it depresses your uh, respiratory drive. So um, you're basically poisoned to death. So. Um, so make sure you're checking these kids' mouths. Um, you're going to want to provide them with oxygen and... Um, other supportive care. Um, otherwise, it could progress to the next slide, which is pulmonary edema. Rest of the slides I thought were pretty self-explanatory. You guys should be familiar with uh, tuberculosis or TB from your practice. Um, and pulmonary aspiration uh, is, is what it is, just like what we talked about. Um, and then I don't know if anybody wanted to touch on foreign body aspiration. I usually talk about that whenever I talk about like accidents and childhood trauma because you know everybody knows accidents are the number one killer of uh, children below a certain age. So uh, foreign body aspiration, just basically, you guys know just from anatomy and physiology that that right bronchus is the shorter, wider, straighter one. So if, if a child picks up something and aspirates it, 
is likely to go into that right bronchus um, and obstruct. Um, usually this happens in kids ages one to three because they're learning and they're walking around and they're picking up stuff. Um, they like to stick things in their nose and all kinds of fun stuff. So these kids will start choking, gagging, coughing. Um, you can hear strider, um, C-cynosis. They'll have difficulty swallowing or speaking. You'll see it on chest x-ray or a bronchoscopy, unfortunately, if it, goes, if it gets that bad. Um, these kids might have trouble speaking, um, and you might have to perform a Heimlich maneuver on them um, and hopefully get the um, item above into the upper bronchus trachea so they can expel it. Um, basically, just uh, educate families on baby proof in the house and keeping an eye on babies, and, and that's the best that you can do. Um, I didn't really talk about the pulmonary edema because uh, it, it's just super rare and, and I'm not sure that you guys will touch on that in pediatrics unless you go into critical care. So um, I hope that this was uh, a little bit helpful. Um, I haven't taught in a couple years, so I'm a little bit scatterbrained and a little bit out of it. But uh, if you guys want more lectures, just let Ira or Shamel know. Or if you have specific questions, uh, let them know, and I will try to get them to you as soon as possible, and I hope this worked. Uh, good luck, and have a great day. Bye.